Part 1 of Chapter 5 of The Abandoned Room This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Abandoned Room by Wadsworth Camp Chapter 5 Section 1 The Crying Through the Woods Bobby's inability to cry out alone prevented his alarming the others and announcing to Paredes and Dr. Groom his unlawful presence in the room. During the moment that the shock held him, silent, motionless, bent in the darkness above the bed, he understood there could have been no ambiguity about his ghastly and loathsome experience. The dead detective had altered his position as Silas Blackburn had done, and this time someone had been in the room and suffered the appalling change. Bobby's fingers still responded to the charnel feeling of cold, inactive flesh suddenly become alive and potent beneath his touch, and a reason for the apparent miracle offered itself. Between the extinction of his candle and the commencement of that movement, only a second or so, the evidence had disappeared from the detective's pocket. Bobby relaxed. He stumbled across the room and into the corridor. He went with hands outstretched through the blackness, for no candle burned in the upper hall, but he knew that Catherine was on guard there. When he left the passage, he saw her, an unnatural figure herself. In the yellowish, unhealthy twilight which sifted through the stairwell from the lamp in the hall below, she must have sensed something out of the way immediately, for she hurried to meet him, and her whisper held no assurance. You got the cast and the handkerchief, Bobby? And when he didn't answer at once, she asked him with a sharp rush of fear, What's the matter? What happened? He shuddered. At last he managed to speak. Catherine, I have felt death cease to be death. Later he was to recall that phrase with a sicker horror than he had experienced now. You saw something, she said, but your candle is out. There is no light in the room. He took her hand, he pressed it. You're real, he said with a nervous laugh, something I can understand. Everything is unreal, this light. He strode to the table, found a match and lighted his candle. Catherine, as she saw his face, drew back. Bobby! My candle went out, he said dully, and he moved through the darkness. I tell you, he moved beneath my hand. She drew farther away, staring at him. You were frightened. No, if we go there with a the light now, he said with the same dull conviction, we will find him as we found my grandfather this afternoon. The monotonous voices of the three men in the lower hall weaved a, a background for their whispers. The normal, familiar sound was like a tonic. Bobby straightened. Catherine threw off the spell of his announcement. But the evidence, you got... She stared at his empty hands. He fancied that he saw contempt in her eyes. In spite of everything, you must go back. You must get that. Even if I had the courage, he said wearily, it would be no use, for the evidence is gone. But I saw it. At least I saw his pocket. It was there, he answered. When my light went out, I did put my hand in his pocket. In that second, it had gone. There was no one there, she said, no one but you, because I watched. He leaned heavily against the wall. Good God, Catherine! It's too big. Whatever it is, we can't fight it. She looked for some time down the corridor at the black entrance of the sinister room. At last she turned and walked to the banister. She called. Hartley, will you come up? Bobby wondered at the steadiness of her voice. The murmuring below ceased. Graham ran up the stairs. Her summons had been warning enough. 
Their attitudes, as Graham reached the upper hall, were eloquent of Bobby's failure. You didn't get the cast in the handkerchief, he said. Bobby told briefly what had happened. What is one to do, he ended. Even the dead are against me. It's beyond belief, Graham said roughly. He snatched up the candle and entered the corridor. Uncertainly, Catherine and Bobby followed him. He went straight to the bed and thrust the candle beneath the canopy. The others could see from the door the change that had taken place. The body of Howells was turned awkwardly on its side. The coat pocket was, as Bobby had described it, flat and empty. Catherine turned and went back to the hall. Graham's hand shook as Bobby's had shaken. No tricks, Bobby. Bobby couldn't resent the suspicion which appeared to offer the only explanation of what had happened. The candle flickered in the draft. Look out, Bobby warned. The misshapen shadows danced with a multiple vivacity across the walls. Graham shaded the candle flame, and the shadows became like morbid decorations, gargantuan and motionless. It's madness, Graham said. There's no explanation of this that we can understand. Howell's straight smile mocked them, as if in answer to Graham a voice sighed through the room. Its quality was one with the shadows, unsubstantial and shapeless, Bobby grasped one of the bedposts and braced himself, listening. The candle in Graham's hand commenced to flicker again, and Bobby knew that it hadn't been his fancy, for Graham listened too. It shook again through the heavy, oppressive night, merely accentuated by the candle, a faint ululation, barely detaching itself from silence straying after a time into the silence again at first it was like the grief of a woman heard at a great distance but the sound while it gained no strength forced on them more and more an abhorrent sense of intimacy this crying from an infinite distance filled the room seemed finally to have its source in the room itself after it sobbed thinly into nothing, its pulsations continued to sigh in Bobby's ears. They seemed timed to the renewed and eccentric dancing of the amorphous shadows. Graham straightened and placed the candle on the bureau. He seemed more startled than he had been at the unbelievable secretiveness of a dead man. You heard it? Bobby breathed. Graham nodded. What was it? Where do you think it came from? Bobby demanded. It was like someone mourning for this, this poor devil. Graham couldn't disguise his effort to elude the somber spell of the room, to drive from his brain the illusion of that unearthly moaning. It must have come from outside the house, he answered. There's no use giving way to fancies where there is a possible explanation. It must have come from outside, from some woman in great agony of mind. Bobby recalled his perception of a woman moving with a curious absence of sound about the edges of the stagnant lake. He spoke of it to Graham. I couldn't be sure it was a woman, but there's no house within two miles. What would a woman be doing wandering around the cedars? At any rate, there are three women in the house, Graham said. Catherine and the two servants, Ella and Jane. The maids are badly frightened. It may have come from the servants' quarters. It must have been one of them. But Bobby saw that Graham didn't believe either of the maids had released that poignant suffering. It didn't sound like a living voice, he said simply. Then how are we to take it? Graham persisted angrily. I shall question Catherine and the two maids. He took up the candle with a stubborn effort to recapture his old forcefulness. But as they left the room, the shadows thronged thickly after them in ominous pursuit, and it wasn't necessary to question Catherine. She stood in the corridor, her lips parted, her face white and shocked. 
What was it, she said? That nearly silent grief. She put her hands to her ears, lowering them helplessly after a moment. Where do you think it came from? Graham asked. From a long ways off, she answered. Then I... I thought it must be in the room with you, and I wondered if you saw... Graham shook his head. We saw nothing. It was probably Ella or Jane. They've been badly frightened. Perhaps a nightmare, or they've heard us moving around the front part of the house. I am going to see. Catherine and Bobby followed him downstairs. Dr. Groom and Peretti stood in front of the fireplace, questioningly looking upward. Paredes didn't speak at first, but Dr. Grooms burst out in his grumbling bass voice. What's been going on up there? Did you hear just now a queer crying? Graham asked. No. You, Paredes? I've heard nothing, Paredes answered, except Dr. Groom's disquieting theories. It's an uncanny hour for such talk. What kind of a cry, may I ask? Like a woman moaning, Bobby said, and Dr. Howells has changed his position. What are you talking about? The doctor cried. He has turned on his side as Mr. Blackburn did, Graham told him. Paredes glanced at Bobby. And how was this new mystery discovered? Bobby caught the implication. Then the Panamanian clung to his slyly expressed doubt of Catherine, which might, after all, have had its impulse in an instinct of self-preservation. Bobby knew that Graham and Catherine would guard the fashion in which the startling discovery had been made. Before he could speak for himself, and indeed, Graham was answering Paredes. This crying seemed after a time to come from the room we entered. But Miss Catherine called you up, Paredi said. I suppose she had heard again movements in the room. Bobby managed a smile. You see, Carlos, nothing is consistent in this case. Paredes bowed gravely. It is very curious a woman should cry about the house. The servants may make it seem natural enough, Graham said. Will you come, Bobby? As they crossed the dining room, they heard a stirring in the kitchen. Graham threw open the door. Jenkins stood at the foot of the servants' stairs. The old butler had lighted a candle and placed it on the mantel. The disorder of his clothing suggested the haste with which he had left his bed and come downstairs. His wrinkled, sunken face had aged perceptibly. He advanced with an expression of obvious relief. I was just coming to find you, Mr. Robert. What's up? Bobby asked. A little while ago I thought you were all asleep back here. One of the women awakened him, Graham said. It's just as I thought. Was that it? The old butler asked with a quick relief. But immediately he shook his head. It couldn't have been that, Mr. Graham, for I stopped at Ella's and Jane's doors, and there was no sound. They seemed to be asleep, and it wasn't like that. You mean, Bobby said, that you heard a woman crying? Jenkins nodded. It woke me up. If you didn't think it was one of the maids, Graham asked, what did you make of it? I thought it came from outside. I thought it was a woman prowling around the house. Then I said to myself, why should a woman prowl around the cedars? And it was too unearthly, sir. And I remember the way Mr. Silas was murdered, and the awful thing that happened to his body this afternoon. And I, you won't think me foolish, sirs. I doubted if it was a human voice I had heard. No, Graham said dryly, we won't think you foolish. So I thought I'd better wake you up and tell you. Graham turned to Bobby. Catherine and you and I, he said, fancied the crying was in the room with us. Jenkins is sure it came from outside the house. That is significant. Wherever it came from, Bobby said softly, it was like someone mourning for howls. Jenkins started. The policeman? Bobby remembered that Jenkins hadn't been aroused by the discovery of Howells' murder. You'd know in a few minutes anyway, he said, 
Howells has been killed as my grandfather was. Jenkins moved back, a look of unbelief and awe in his wrinkled face. He boasted he was going to sleep in that room, he whispered. Bobby studied Jenkins, not knowing what to make of the old man, for into the awe of the wrinkled face had stolen a positive relief, an emotion that bordered on the triumphant. It's terrible, Jenkins whispered. Graham grasped his shoulder. What's the matter with you, Jenkins? One would say you were glad. No, oh, no, sir, it's terrible. I was only wondering about the policeman's report. What do you know about his report, Bobby cried? Only that, that he gave it to me to mail just before he went up to the old room. You mailed it? Graham snapped. Jenkins hesitated. When he answered, his voice was self-accusing. I am an old coward, Mr. Roberts. The policeman told me the letter was very important, and if anything happened to it, I would get in trouble. He couldn't afford to leave the house himself, he said, but, as I say, I am a coward, and I didn't want to walk through the woods to the box by the gate. I figured it all out. It wouldn't be taken up until early in the morning, and if I waited until daylight, it would only be delayed one collection. So I made up my mind I'd sleep on it, because I knew he had it in for you, Mr. Robert. I suppose I'd mailed it in the morning, but I decided I'd think it over anyway and not harrow myself walking through the woods. You've done a good job, Graham said excitedly. Where is the report now? In my room. Shall I fetch it, sir? Graham nodded, and Jenkins shuffled up the stairs. What luck, Graham said. Howells must have telephoned his suspicions to the district attorney. He must have mentioned the evidence. But what does that amount to since it disappeared along with the duplicate of the report? If Howells made one. I can fight with a clear conscience, Bobby cried. I wasn't asleep when Howell's body altered its position. Do you realize what that means to me? For once I was wide awake when the old room was at its tricks. If Howells were alive, Graham answered shortly, he would look on the fact that you were awake and alone with the body as the worst possible evidence against you. Bobby's elation died. There is always something to tangle me in the eyes of the law with these mysteries. But I know, and I'll fight. Can you find any trace of a conspiracy against me in this last ghastly adventure? It complicates everything, Graham admitted. It's beyond sounding, Bobby said. For my grandfather's death last night and the disturbance of his body this afternoon seem calculated to condemn me absolutely. Yet Howells's murder and the movement of his body, with the disappearance of the cast and the handkerchief, seem designed to save me. Are there two influences at work in this house? One for me, one against me? Let's think of the human elements, Graham answered with a frown. I have no faith in Paredes. My man has failed to report on Maria. That's queer. You fancy a woman in black slipping through the woods, and we hear a woman cry. I want to account for those things before I give in to Grooms's spirits. I confess at times they seem the only logical explanation. Here's Jenkins. If trouble comes of his withholding the report, I'll take the blame, Bobby said. Graham snatched the long envelope from Jenkins' hand. It was addressed in a firm hand to the district attorney at the county seat. There's no question, Graham said. That's it. We mustn't open it. We'd better not destroy it. Put it where it won't be easily found, Jenkins. If you are questioned, you have no recollection of Howells having given it to you. Mr. Blackburn promises he will see you get in no trouble. The old man smiled. Trouble, he scoffed. Mr. Blackburn needn't fret himself about me. He's the last of this family. That is Miss Catherine and he. I'm old and about done for. I don't mind trouble. Not a bit, sir. Bobby pressed his hand. His voice was a little husky. 
I didn't think you'd go that far in my service, Jenkins. The old butler smiled slyly. I'd go a lot further than that, sir. We'd better get back, Graham said. The bloodhounds ought to be here. And they'll sniff at the case harder than ever because it's done for howls. They watched Jenkins go upstairs with the report. We're taking long chances, Graham said. Desperately long chances. But you're in a desperately dangerous position. It's the only way. You'll be accused of stealing the evidence. But remember, when they question you, they can prove nothing unless the cast and handkerchief turn up. If they've been taken by an enemy in some magical fashion to be produced at the proper moment, there's no hope. Meantime, play the game, and Catherine and I will help you all we can. The doctor, too, is friendly. There's no doubt of him. Come now, let's face the music. Bobby followed Graham to the hall, trying to strengthen his nerves for the ordeal. Even now he was more appalled by the apparently supernatural background of the case than he was by the material details which pointed to his guilt. More than the report and the cast and the handkerchief, the remembrance of that impossible moment in the blackness of the old room filled his mind, and the unearthly and remote crying still throbbed in his ears. Catherine, Graham, and the doctor waited by the fireplace. They had heard nothing from the authorities. But they must be here soon, Dr. Groom said. Did you learn anything back there, Hartley? Catherine asked. It wasn't the servants, he said. Jenkins heard the crying. He's certain it came from outside the house. Paredes looked up. Extraordinary, he said. I wish I had heard it. Dr. Groom grumbled. Paredes laughed. Thank the good Lord I didn't. Perpetually, Bobby, your house reminds me that I've nerves sensitive to the unknown world. I will go further than the doctor. I will say that this house is crowded with the supernatural. It shelters things that we cannot understand, that we will never understand. When I was a child in Panama, I had a nurse who, unfortunately, developed too strongly my native superstition. How she frightened me with her bedtime stories. They were all of men murdered or dead of fevers, crossing the trail or building the railroad or digging insufficient ditches for de lesseps. Some of her best went further back than that. They were thick with the ghosts of old Spaniards and the crimson hands of Morgan's buccaneers. Really, that tiny strip across the isthmus is crowded with souls snatched too quickly from torn and tortured bodies. If you are sensitive, you feel they are still there. What has all this to do with the cedars? Dr. Groom grumbled. It explains my ability to sense strange elements in this old house. There are in Panama, if you don't mind, doctor, improvised graveyards tangled by the jungle that give you a feeling of an active unseen population precisely as this house does he arose and strolled with a cat-like lack of sound about the hall when he spoke again his voice was scarcely audible it was the voice of a man who thinks aloud and the doctor failed to interrupt him again I have felt less spiritually alarmed in those places of grinning skulls, which always seem trying to recite agonies beyond expression, than I feel in this house, for here the woods are more desolate than the jungle, and the walls of houses as old as this make a prison for suffering. End of chapter 5, section 1 of the abandoned room.